Hey guys, welcome to my stream. So, let's see. <clears throat> Gotta get back into this. So last week, what did we do last week? Ah oh, yeah. So last week, um, we started looking at, started exploring uh, a way to, to launch multiple instances of the emulator and have them connect to each other. Like I want to be able to, let's say, launch two, two instances of my emulator. One with, a, say, my CPU and one with a, another implementation like the VEC-X. Have them connect to each other, like over, uh, over TCP. And um, and then basically, I want them to both kind of like remain in sync and execute instructions and effectively compare. You know, let let each other know what was the what was the uh, result of their instruction that they just executed and compare. So basically, instead of doing this kind of like tracing and then comparing afterwards, let's kind of compare as we execute to see you know where where we differ and and catch it as soon as it happens. Now, I just want to remind everyone, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I haven't actually done network coding for seriously a really long time. I think the last time I wrote any network code was like in university, which is when I had to write like some kind of FTP server thing. And that was a long time ago. So, and since then, I, you know, I've used, I've worked in, in engines with networking in it, but I haven't really written protocols and stuff like that myself. So it's been kind of fun think about and then start looking at. So I did commit a couple of things right after last stream. Um, I have this branch, Network Compare, and uh, so this is the commit where I've added the dependency on SDLnet. And then the last, the next one is this launch with SDLnet support and add TCP server and TCP client classes that man manage connection details. So that's, that's basically what we worked on last stream, this TCP server and TCP client wrapper, and uh, just making sure to include SDLnet, initialize it and shut it down at the end here. So that gets us just the basics going so we can start connecting and sending data. Now, since then, I think like the day after or something, last Thursday, um, just as a kind of like a, a test, I wanted to see if like what the performance would be like if I tried to run two instances and send something from one to the other for every instruction. Um, so that, that's what this code is doing here. So yeah, I start and I, if I pass a parameter of dash server and one of dash client, I store which one I am. And uh, oh yeah, I also commented out this randomization I had of RAM because my two instances were running differently. And then basically, in my debugger, I've added in, I added an instance of the server and the client. I extern these globals, and what I do is it's here that I do the kind of server and client connection stuff right at the beginning. And once we're connected, I I guess I could show this more in context in the code because it's a bit confusing looking at it here. Uh, so let's go to our debugger. Yeah, so, okay. Let's see here. So, the, all right, so this is the init function for the debugger. This is where the server will block and just wait, keep waiting until it gets a connection, and the client will send its open, which will connect. And then, once we pass there, both of them will start running. And over here, in the execute instruction, which happens per instruction, I added this code that says if I'm the server and uh, Oh yeah, this was my, what was I doing here? Oh yeah, I was messing around with how often I can send data. This was like, if if I skip, what was I doing here? If I skip a hundred, or if I wait a hundred frames, then I go ahead and I receive, why did I do this again? 
yeah so i was thinking i would send like basically the equivalent or probably less but something like the size of the instruction trace info and uh yeah so that's it I, I i let's say i would have a buffer of 50 of them to send or to say the equivalent of 50 in terms of size so it's a pretty large amount to send and the server after let's say 100 frames will go ahead and Oh, in this case, the client would be sending and the server would be receiving. I don't know why why I decided on that. It could be the other way around. The server could send and the client could receive. That's probably what I'm going to end up doing. But anyway, this here is enough because the receive here is a blocking call and so is the send. Is the send a blocking call? Actually, I don't think the send is blocking, but the receive is. Anyway, so this, this actually kind of turned out okay. Just a, just kind of like a quick test to see if it would be, no, that's not it, over here. Where's my, uh, did I move it? Yeah, it's okay, so it's over here. So I have client here and I have server here. So I think I start with server. Okay, wait a second. Yeah, the reason why it's not working is because I modified my options. For streaming. Window X. Let's try this here, just to see. Yeah. Now, I think I killed my other window by accident. So I'm gonna do a... Okay, there we go. So vectrexy dash server. Okay, so that starts this guy and vectrexy dash client. And we end up with with this here. Now I think I may have messed up the timing, but we'll see. So actually the frame rates here are worse than when I test off stream. And I think that's because I'm using some CPU right now and I'm probably maxing out, let me see. Yeah, my performance is right up near the 100 mark. But you can see that they're, they're you know, fairly synced right now. And this is like, basically I'm not doing anything right, you know, but if we just wait a bit, you can see it's, it's all deterministic. So yeah, and I mean, I can easily break this. As soon as I start moving inputs on one of these like this, now I've, I've totally broken determinism. But that's fine. Because what I need to do to make this all work, so this, this was just a kind of a litmus test to see if this was possible, but I was really thinking more about it. And I was thinking that what I need to do is have some kind of protocol where to make this really work, I need to have, let's say at the engine level, my SDL engine, perhaps in the engine, or maybe not at the engine, I'm not sure yet. But let's say here, this is SDL engine. Um, actually, probably where I want to do this is not engine, maybe in main. Yeah, maybe in here. Yeah, because one of the problems I have right now is I would like for the, both of them to be simulating at the same frame time. But the frame time is something that I compute at, at the engine level, which is why I guess I was thinking about it here. I have this like uh, update frame time here. And then I like use this when I call client update and client render, right? And what I would need to do then is that every frame I would need to not only like say, let's say it's a server that, that is in you know, that uh, leads, it would compute the frame time and then send a frame time to, to the other. Or the other thing I can do to really simplify all this is just, you know, forget the frame time and just kind of send a uh, fixed delta time, it's a fixed frame time to both. That probably would, would be easier. 
So anyway, one of those things, basically. Um, and then the other thing I need to send are the inputs, which is also something that I compute over here. And I, you know, I send in, so. Yeah, maybe I could still do this. Let me think about this. The frame time is here, it's here. The only thing that sucks is this render scene. Okay. Anyway, and then there's the input. And I would like to share, you know, one of them would, would process inputs and the other one would just receive them and not process inputs from the, uh, the keyboard or whatever. And... Okay, so here. So server would compute and send frame time, and update with it. So send frame time and I'll say plus inputs. And the client would receive frame time plus inputs, update with it. Then within the debugger code, this is where we're handling our instruction stuff right now. I was thinking at first, I just remove this for a sec. I would say, I was thinking, okay, server, so for every instruction would send an instruction message and then wait for the client. Now the client for every instruction would receive this instruction message, execute its own and compare. And if it doesn't match, it would send back a no match message and stop. Otherwise it would send a match, match message and continue. At which point the server, if it receives a no match, it stops. Otherwise if it receives a match, it continues. Now this seems like a pretty simple protocol the only thing I worry about is this kind of like blocking, you know, multiple times per instruction, which would be probably quite slow. But we can try it. And if this doesn't work, the other thing I was thinking of was, and this was what I was starting to write here, was like, uh, I'll write here like, primitively, if too slow. Like it would be like this, the server for every, uh, and this would be kind of the debugger level. So for every instruction, I would, like I have a frame to do, right? Uh, like I have a frame time to do and I would have to execute a certain number of instructions for that frame time. Cause that's exactly what our debugger does. Go back to our debugger here. Except when I'm broken into the debugger, what we're really doing most of the time is we're saying, all right, how many, how many cycles do we need to execute this frame by taking the frame time and multiplying it by our CPU frequency. And then we basically want to accumulate how many cycles we have left here. And while we have cycles left to do, we come here and we call execute instruction, get back how many cycles have elapsed, and we subtract that from our CPU cycles left. And so we keep doing this until our CPU cycles left is less, is a um, is zero or less and it, it can go into the negative and that's that's totally fine so the idea then is we have to say this big chunk of frame time let's say we're going to execute i don't know 100 instructions so i'm thinking we execute those 100 instructions and for each one we compute a hash uh for like a crc 32 or whatever of the data in the instruction info, and we keep accumulating this hash. We, we, we start at zero, let's say the hash is initialized to a known value like zero, and then we keep adding that the hash of every instruction, let's say there's 100 instructions for the current frame. So we keep rehashing on top of the existing one, and we end up with this you know 32-bit value, and then per frame, we send just that value from the server to the client. The client on its end has been hashing, and it as well will then receive this compare the two. And now if they're the same, we're good. If they're not the same, that means that somewhere in the last frame of one of those instructions, we we messed up, like we, we something doesn't match. And now at that point, which instruction is it, right? And I was thinking like, there's multiple ways I can go about this. Like, I mean, one way is really dumb is we just stop and we just show the trace of the last whatever and we compare and like we should be able to find it. But if I want it to be really cool, you know, if I wanted this thing to really work well, um, at the moment we realize that the hashes are no longer matching, we don't care anymore about performance. And at this point, we can, the server can say, okay, here are all the instructions, you know, go back to what I have here and say, here are all the instructions that I uh, executed since the last frame. And then on the client, it can say, okay, I've got all of my instructions, let me compare until I say, oh, you know, here's a mismatch. 
So I mean, I can literally send a whole dump of all the instructions and then the other one, other side can just go through and compare until we see a mismatch and then report the mismatch. So that's probably what I'm gonna have to do for performance reasons, but I'm gonna start with the simpler, more direct version. If that makes any sense. Now, time to do this. I just need to figure out how I want to organize all this, this protocol, and like, I don't want to put code all over the place, but at the same time, I kind of feel like I need to right now. I'm trying to think how I want to organize this code. Because the fact that I need to split it between the, the engine and the debugger is what kind of breaks everything. Yeah, I was just thinking like, if I if I do it in main, which is probably the place where it makes the most sense, um, that I do the high level stuff because this is like right in the re the the emulator itself and not in the SDL engine part. Um, then what I can do is, even though we get a frame time here on the client, I can just ignore this and just use the one that I received. I can ignore the input and reduce the one I received. I can clear the MU events because we don't really care. All right? Because all of these have to do with, uh, yeah, don't care about that. Use that same frame time here. Not instruction to compare, but just like say, like sync protocol. to its own header. I'm just going to start it here. Speed.h. Okay. This will be called 
plants. And the only reason I'm making these unique pointers is just to make sure I don't make a mistake and try to access one or the other like on the wrong side. So. No? Um, oh, it's searching and selection, that's why. Initialization for both. Now, what we're going to want is oh, send frame start. Now I need some types for this. Okay, I think I'm gonna make my, my file now. Source.
So yeah, I was thinking about these messages that I want to send. Something like, uh, I'm gonna need some kind of type. So, frame start. Or can I just, can I use the same name or is that gonna clash because they're types? I know it's gonna work because this is scoped. Okay, so that should be okay. I'm gonna need to have the type because I need to send this over the network, right? So frame start, we'll have the frame time. And yeah, I'm gonna have to like serialize my input data. That's one thing, I'm gonna to have to add serialization functions. I think I would want to do this. You know what? Maybe I'll just skip input for now because this won't be as important as the frame time. I'll, I'll do it after. Actually, all of them will have to have a type as their first parameter. So can I do it this way? Maybe I'll just, for now, just to keep it simple. I'll forget about the base class. We'll see about that after. Um, Cause this way I can just easily create my, my type this way, my message this way. I can send it this way. Now for the receive, First thing I'm gonna do uh, or maybe may, okay actually yeah I know I know I won't put the type in here that's what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna send them as two separate things 
Uh, that's what I was thinking. You can send here the type as send send frame start and then send a message. this way again. This can be const. Then I could send a temporary. Yeah. So I send a type and I send a message and I receive a type. gonna for now I'm just gonna do like a assert that type is equal to frame start in which case we can receive a frame start Something like this. So let's see if we can hook this up. C is equal to two. Then we use argv one. Yeah, now I'm gonna need to kind of know. is equal to dash server else if r is equal to dash client else we're going to assume it's the wrong
Okay, so then Okay, so now what I need here is wheel is server. to check so if sync client sync protocol dot is server send frame start this frame time and I'll send the input else if I think I went with floats when I should have done doubles everywhere. Okay. stuff I put in the debugger. this crap I have in here. All right, so let's see if this actually works. Take this, take this. Move our server. Connected. Oh, and I got a crash. Looks like the server started, but the client ended up crashing. So that's that's interesting. Just take a quick look at this code again. Okay, so what we could do is we can launch the server because we know that seems to work, and when we'll debug with the client and see what we get.
the server is still waiting for a connection. Here, and this is where I suspect we have a problem. Read access violation. This was not part of this. Did I not do an init client here? I did. This is why I'm happy. I'm happy I'm using pointers for these. Okay, so let me kill this server. Let's start the client again. a type it is a frame start we received our message and we have a frame time great let's see how this goes <laughs> okay so totally not in sync right now maybe because I'm running a debug version also because I'm not yeah I'm not waiting that's another thing I gotta wait for the client to say that it did its frame. Yeah, that's super important. So right now the server's just running as fast as it can, sending frames, and the client will just try to keep up. Which, and technically is probably not a big deal, but probably would be nice to have them be in sync so that when one fails, yeah. Um, yeah, I gotta kill this one here. And also, I'm not exactly doing my render with the same frame time, that's true. Which is less important, technically speaking. Okay, let's put in the uh, the wait. So I'm a server. I send the frame start. Oh, 
wait frame end. Or I'll say receive frame end. Just so I don't have to do the using namespace everywhere. Message type. I wonder if I really need a type to send in this case. I could just send the... I don't really need a struct for the frame end, do I? It's just an empty one. I could just send the message type and be done with it.
for the server, we go receive frame end. Otherwise we say client send frame end. say if it's a server or client that's receiving So now they should be in sync. There we go. Great. Oh, that's cool. I can even fast forward on this. Okay, so actually my server is on the right right now because I wasn't sure which was which. Like if I fast forward, it sends the frame time, right? What I'm not doing yet is sending inputs, so I can still break it by changing inputs, but like as soon as I do this, now we're no longer in sync. Everything's messed up now. This is pretty cool, right? Okay. Getting somewhere. Let's see if we can send those inputs. I think we can actually just cheat this one. Because I mean it's just it's just a POD. So I can just literally write the whole thing. It's it's uh it's not the right way to do it, you know, technically speaking, but it should work. And I don't really care. I mean there's a lot of things I'm not doing right. Technically speaking, I should serialize each field and you know do the whole uh use uh, a <clears throat> worry about like endianness if we wanted to connect between machines of different endianness and all that but i really don't care about that because it's just my machine to my machine for this type of thing and i don't care too much either about uh the fact that i'm not supposed to just 
and that it's undefined behavior to like copy the bits of a of a class type like this back and forth. So let's see if we can make this work. Um, I guess it's in here. Copy the inputs, and just send it, and then here we'll receive it. Sent. Now let's see if I move my my ship. Oh yeah! Oh man, that's awesome. These are actually playing completely in sync. That's super cool. We can see that it's like completely deterministic right now, as it should be. crazy. Yeah, it's a total cheat and very much not, uh, would not work on different types of machines or maybe not even sure if it would work on two machines, like two Windows machines for that matter. But that would more have to do with like the fact that we're sending floating point values across. Oh, and then we got a read from unmap range. Cool, and it's actually happening the same way on both machines. Okay, so let's, uh... yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, so we'll just quit now. Okay, so next, the next part will be the sending of instructions, serializing that data and comparing it. Let me uh, let me just clean up the code now, because this is a, this is in a pretty good spot for for me to commit this. No, that's why. So basically undo all the changes in debugger. Let's go to engine here. We don't need any of this. Got this in main. But I'll do it here though, just for now. Say if his his server or his client.
Oh, actually, we're not the server, and we're not the clients. So for this, I'll say sync frame start and end for server and client. Sync, sync for the one. sending frame times and inputs. Syncing frame time and inputs. And something like that. Okay, so now we can keep going. Okay, so the next bit is going to be sending the instruction data. Now this is really going to slow us down, there's no doubt. But we'll try. So we are about to execute an instruction. We want the server to execute it. We want the client to execute it and then we want them to compare. Now one thing is, the way I've done this code is I had this scoped exit thing. Which is because of the instruction trace. So maybe actually we want to put our code in there. suppose we only want to do it if trace is enabled anyway. What is this G curve trace for again? Oh, what a hack. <laughs> right. That's a disgusting hack. here oh actually yeah we're gonna have to send in our sync protocol into our debugger here OK, 
Okay, so if is server, then we want to send server send instruction, I guess. Yeah. In this case, I cannot send it as is. It's not really a POD. Or it is, but it's not going to work because it has pointers. Specifically, it has a CPU op here, this pointer. It's got these CPU registers. This this could be sent as is. That would be no problem. Pre and post. How many cycles have elapsed? That would be fine. This std array would be fine as well. Okay, so let's define a type, which is just a std array that is the size of the instruction trace info. I'm going to write a little function to like serialize it. This is a super hack, but whatever. So what we're going to do is um, if we're writing to copy here.
yeah, probably that's what I need to do. Now here's the trick. The thing is I'm copying that pointer in there, right? This is bytes, right? Take the op and oh, I need to know which page it's sent to. I am camp here. I kind of have no choice if I want to serialize this. I can't I have this mess of three tables of op codes that I need to. So I need to give it a CPU op and I need to get back which table we're talking about. So I've got a CPU hop and I'm going to see which table it's part of. I don't really need this. If the address of the CPU hop is greater than or equal to Actually, I could just do this. If it's greater than equal to CPU ops page two,
Okay, so that should tell me which table and give me a pointer to the first one. And I can use that to compute an offset. for this and subtract subtract the oops okay this is a pointer I need that no actually I do need that it's a reference to the pointer and I want to set the pointer itself now to be equal to this Minus this. Oh no, it's the other way around. This minus this table. So that basically computes an offset. But I found the int cannot be assigned to an entity type constant. Yeah, that's true. Ah, oh, what a mess. Now otherwise, we can go the other way around. We mem copy into info from the buffer. That's the thing though, I don't know which table it was in.
we get an offset. I also need to know what's the CPU table. Here we are. I need to stuff those both into, both into a pointer. This is definitely not the right way to do it, but again, this is right now the easiest way for me to try this. Ideally, I'd just serialize this to some data data stream and then just serialize it back and everything would be beautiful. So now, now I got the, the, the pointer back here. Now I gotta break it up into its um, two bits, two parts. In fact, it's gonna be index and offset. No.
just do here? I think I lost some information. Oh no, okay, I put the reinterpret cast the wrong place. The largest table has 256 entries, right? Yeah. Oh, now, <clears throat> this actually works. I'll be amazed. And I think that's the only thing I need to worry about right now. would seem so okay so given that I have now an instruction trace info buffer and this way to serialize it Think about how I have to expose my types in there, or do I really need to? I'm gonna need an instruction start and an instruction end. server will send the instruction, the client will receive it, and the client will send back. It's okay. I think I know what I'll do. I'll just try something here.
Maybe I can just, okay, it's like generic. Try something here. protocol that's not my problem here all right um, because this is actually a that's a pointer. Pointers. 
same here. it here before I shift it yeah send that it is an instruction I really should have a send type just to match make more sense It's the same thing, but it'll just look cleaner here. Send that we're sending a instruction. Not a template. In fact, neither is this. Okay, so we send this type. And now this is where we do the serialization into our to our buffer. So I need a trace info instruction trace info buffer serialize true. We're going to be writing the info that we built into the buffer. And then we're going to send that. I guess we can do this all together here. Connection type. Else, if sync protocol dot is client. Then in a similar fashion, we're going to be receiving a buffer. So first we'll say sync protocol. Numlock. Receive type. We expect to receive instruction. Receive value buffer serialize the now it's going to be saying false because we're reading the info and that's it right so that's the thing I need a separate trace info now Um, 
and I need the buffer. Compare trace info with trace info server here. For now, we'll just check if it's at least the same type of instruction. Just check if the op is the same. This is going to be completely relying on whether or not my serialization code actually did what it's supposed to do. space here. actually work. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think this could actually work. It's too bad. understand that error message a bit more.
failure was caused by read of a variable outside its lifetime. I was hoping to do this without using templates and specializations or like overloads. That's what the whole point of this was, but I guess I could. Let me see. slow way. Doesn't matter. So my confidence level in this code working is very low. Got to send the sync protocol down to the debugger. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just debug this because I want, I want to see if that serialization code will even work. So here we have an instruction. We're going to go serialize it. We're writing copied all the data to this buffer. Now we're grabbing the instruction trace info. We reinterpret casted. So let me see what this looks like. So we have B and we have uh, info here. These should be the same. Yeah, it looks the same. Which makes sense so far. So there's our CPU off. 0xCE, it's LDS. Very good. Alright, so CPU op. Here's our pointer to the CPU op directly, and we're going to figure out which instruction table it came from. So it came from zero. Yeah, CPU ops page zero, there it is, and index is zero. So that makes sense. Now we're going to compute offset. That does not look good.
So 716. That makes sense. LTS immediate load stack pointer. Oh, so I got the wrong table actually. Hmm. So my CPU op is supposed to be a pointer to one of these entries. Mm -hmm.
206. Galaxy. What? Zero so XCE is LDS. Oh, okay, sorry, here it is. Okay, so it's this LDS. I think I know what's going on here. I think what's happening is we have I have different copies of CPU ops page zero in memory. I have a CPU op here that my debugger got. At EB0E28. But this corresponds to an instruction in op page one that has a completely different address. E28. Okay, so this lookup function actually does return. Oh, right. Oh, right. Why did I do this again?
mid lookup. Okay, so I have, my, I have a different copy of the lookup table here. Why did I do this again? It was to go faster, I think. Indexed by page and opcode. Okay. So, uh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Right. Okay, I can actually I can fix this. What I can do is I can store this as a pointer to pointer of CPU op instead and store the address. Doesn't make sense. Right, I guess these are. Okay, you know what? I think it's time for me to take a little break. But this is the problem. The problem is, is that I have this other set of opcode tables to optimize my lookups at right, a runtime, where given a page and an opcode, I can get back the CPU op pointer right away. Now the thing is, the CPU op pointer should still be the ones that come directly from this page. So that's what surprises me. Okay, step away from the problem and in a couple of nights on Wednesday night, we'll, we'll figure this out. But we're getting closer. So guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in a couple nights.